Welcome back to the shop. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about one of the most useful, versatile, and affordable tools that there is in the wood shop, and that's the miter saw. We're going to talk a little bit about what the miter saw can do and what it can't do, and also how to safely operate the miter saw. Let's take a look at what the miter saw is capable of. So there's one thing that the miter saw really excels at, and that is called a cross cut. Okay, so if we take a look at this board here and hold it up to the camera so you get a good view, you can see the grain is running left to right here. Okay, if I cut across that grain, that is something called a cross cut. And that is what this saw is excels at doing. It's very good at cross cuts. Okay, what we cannot do with this saw is do a rip cut. And if I was to cut along the grain, such as I was ripping this board, that's a rip cut. Okay, if I was ripping it like it was a piece of paper, that's called a rip cut. You cannot make rip cuts on the miter saw. The type of blade that it has will jam up when you're trying to do a cross cut. So even if you have a short board that could be cut with the grain, you would never ever want to do that because the blade is very likely to bind up and throw the board out of there. So this saw is very good at cross cuts. It is not capable of doing rip cuts. So while you could physically force it to do it, it is always an unsafe operation. Do not ever try a rip cut with it. That's gonna be okay because most of the time when we're cutting on this saw, we're gonna be using dimensional lumber. So such as a two by four, two by six. Okay, and we're gonna cut it to the length. The board already comes to the other dimensions that we need and we simply have to cut it to length. The miter saw or chop saw. Is so let's take a little bit more detailed look at what a cross cut actually is. So we've already learned a cross cut is cutting across the grain. And I could simply do a 90 degree cut across the grain here and that would lead me to get a 90 degree cut on my board. If I was to compare that to a square that's measured at 90 degrees, I could easily see that this is gonna be perfectly 90 degrees, okay? So that's a cross cut. But there's a whole lot of other cross cuts too. If I was to take this saw and swing this around, I could get a whole lot of different angles of cross cuts. So in other words, what would be happening with this tool is as the blade comes down to cut this, the blade is actually cutting it at a different angle, okay? All of those are technically cross cuts. So anytime we cut across the grain, whether it's a straight 90 degree cut or whether it's some other degree cut, all of those count as cross cuts. And that's where the miter saw is a, excels as a tool. It's a great tool for doing cross cuts. So when looking Very at precise. cross cuts in a little more detail, let's go ahead and take a look at several of them. So this one here is a picture frame. And each of these corners is gonna be 90 degrees. Adding them up total, they'll be 360 degrees all the way around here, okay? Both the inside is 90 degrees and the outside is 90 degrees, okay? The way that I cut that is I cut this piece here with a perfectly 90 degree angle on it and that's gonna give me 90 degree here. And then I cut this one the same way, perfectly 90 degree angle right here, okay? When I put those together, they will equal that perfectly 90 degrees. There is a disadvantage of cutting this though, and what happens is when you put these together, it's gonna leave this ugly end grain here, okay? So a lot of times you're gonna want to avoid that ugly end grain, and so there's a joint that hides it. That joint is called a miter joint, and that's where the miter saw gets its name. You might think it would be called a crosscut saw, but it's actually called a miter saw because it excels so much at doing these miter joints. Miter joints can be something that are kind of tricky to get perfectly accurate, and the miter saw just does this extraordinarily well. So let's take a look at what a miter joint is, okay? So we still have this 90 degrees that we need to attain, okay? 90 degrees there and 90 degrees on the outside. But in order to do that, we need to have each of these joints be slightly different. So let me show you what it looks like. Here's our joint. And what it does is it hides the end grain on the edge of the board there. So there's no end grain on that side 
and there's no end grain on the other side. Okay, that's the advantage of a miter joint. The disadvantage is it's slightly weaker than the other way of joining it. So let's put those two together. Now, a miter joint is a very particular angle, and since we need 90 degrees total, what we need to do is divide each of these up into halves. So this board here is going to be 45 degrees, this board here is going to be cut to 45 degrees. Okay, And we'll just check that on the square here and show you that it is indeed 45 degrees. Okay, So 45 degree cut. When we add those together, we get our 90. And again, that's called a miter cut. Very important to remember when you're using the miter saw, that's why it is called a miter saw and not a crosscut saw. Even though what the miter saw does is make all different types of crosscuts. And it can do anywhere from zero or a 90 degree cut, and it can swing all the way up to about 48 degrees. So that should cover every range because you can flip the boards over to get the other half of the 90, okay? So that's a, that's a 90 degree cut, which is just a straight cross cut, and then a miter cut, which is a 45 degrees cut. Talk a little bit about the parts of a miter saw. We'll start with this one here. Almost all the tools in the wood shop have some type of table. The table's there to give a base of support for the material being cut. If I was to just try holding this board into the saw, the saw blade would rip it out of my hands. And that's the truth for every single tool in the shop. So every tool is gonna have some kind of table. And in this case, the table is this flat surface right here in the front. Okay, very important for our safety. We'll talk about it a little bit later on when we talk about safety. But flat part, table. This flat part in the back here, this is called the fence. And the fence does the same thing as the table. It prevents the wood from moving so that the board doesn't get ripped out of your hands and just sent flying. So the table, or sorry, the table and the fence are two of the most important parts of this saw. And they'll be utilized during every single cut you make on it. So again, the flat horizontal is the table and the flat vertical is the fence, okay? And both, there's a fence on both sides and there's a table on both sides as well. So uh, table, fence. Uh, next up, let's talk about this hold down clamp here. The hold down clamp in this case attaches to the fence and then it will clamp something down to the table. So this clamp could be adjusted to hold this tight so that if you didn't want to keep your fingers holding something down, you could just tighten the clamp and it would hold it in place. It's another safety feature and it's something that you will use whenever possible. Each saw will have a different version of this hold down clamp. This one here is kind of a primitive version. It just screws down. There's a lot of quick change ones on the market and usually those are a superior choice. The next piece of uh, this saw that I wanted to talk about is this plastic piece that surrounds the blade. This is called the blade guard. And it, it fully encloses the blade when the saw is up. And as you drop the saw blade down, the guard will automatically open. It's very important that the guard is in place. If this thing is removed or disabled or damaged, you should not ever use the saw, okay? Um, I know some people that have used theirs with the guard off. Uh, it would be tremendously dangerous to have this blade inches from your body spinning. If anything was to go wrong, it would be an instant accident and an instant uh, trip to the emergency room. So definitely make sure this guard is in place and functions properly. Again, should be closed when the saw is up and as you drop the saw down, the guard will open a little bit more until it's down all the way, at which point the guard will open as far as it needs to go. Okay? That is the blade guard. I also want you to realize that the blade guard is only plastic and it, the blade will cut through it instantly. So if you are pushing on this blade guard, uh, your body pushes on it or hits something, the blade will cut right through it. So it's a good piece of safety equipment, but you have to understand its limitations. If I pull this blade guard up, the blade will be exposed. And there's a couple parts of the blade that I wanted you to take note of. So the whole thing is called the blade. Okay, and it has a plate, it has an arbor hole, and then it has teeth on it. And so uh, it's important that you know the parts of the blade. Now, 
This blade here is a blade specifically made for cross cutting. So that what that basically means is that it's going to have a lot of teeth because a cross cut is going to take very small niblets out of a board. Whereas a rip cut is going to take bigger striations out of that board. This is going to take very small bites very quickly. And it just has something to do with the grain structure of the board. It's a little bit more detail than I want to get into in this video, but just suffice it to say, there will be a specific type of blade on this and it will be made specifically for cross cutting. And that's why you cannot do any other cuts with it. No rip cuts on this saw. Okay. So again, plate is this big, in this case, red part of the blade. And then the teeth are these sharp little um, hooks on the end of the blade. Okay. The teeth are always going to be slightly fatter than the plate. And that keeps boards from rubbing on the plate, heating up and expanding into the blade. So the teeth, the plate, and the arbor hole are the parts of the blade I want you to know. And it's important to know that the teeth are always slightly fatter than the plate. So that'll conclude all the parts of the saw that I want you to know. The table, the fence, the hold down clamp, the blade guard, and the blade. Okay, then we'll go into how the saw actually operates has several variations so let me just go through and explain this one here this is a top of the line sliding miter saw and miter saws range from about a hundred dollars all the way up to around sixteen hundred dollars with most of them being in the 150 to 500 dollar range depending on the size and features of the saw so let's take a few uh, look at the few of the features of this saw so they call this saw a miter saw because the table will swing and allow this blade to cut a miter cut, which as we learned was a 45 degree cut. So they're very good at doing that. So one feature of this saw is the table will swing back and forth, allowing you to cut different angles. Okay, that's why it's called a miter saw. This saw here, uh, let me lock this thing in place. This saw here is also something called a compound miter saw. Now occasionally you're going to need to cut two angles at once. So if I had a three dimensional picture frame that I wanted to sit out from the wall more, I could cut the two angles on the, uh, on the miter joint so that they were a compound angle, meaning it would be cut at an angle this way and at an angle this way. And what that does is make it stick out from the wall. The most common example of that is crown molding in houses. If you look at the top ceiling of a house, um, a lot of times in the corners you'll see crown molding and that's that angled um, molding that you see up in the corners. That's cut with a compound angle. So the way that it cuts compound is there's a little uh, lock back here that will allow this thing to unlock and then I can swing this thing both directions. And so if I, swing it, oops, if I swing it this way and I swing the table, we now have a compound joint. In other words, there's two angles being cut at once. So this saw is actually a compound miter saw. In addition to the compound movement of the cuts, um, this saw is also comes equipped with this mechanism here, and this allows the saw blade to slide forward and back. That's an important feature, and it ends up costing money to get that feature. And the reason that it's important is it lets you cut wider boards. If you don't have the sliding feature, the saws are pretty much limited to about a six inch wide board. Anything wider than that, you have to flip the board over to cut it from the other side as well, or you just can't cut it. So the sliding miter saw typically about doubles the cross cut capacity uh, to about 12 inches. So that is, this saw here is a sliding compound miter saw. And then the last feature I wanted to talk about is the size of the blade. And this blade here is a 12 inch wide blade. Some of them come with eight inch blades. Most of them come with 10 inch blades and the biggest saws come with a 12 inch blade. While 12 inch gives you the highest cut capacity, I actually think the sweet spot is the 10 inch blade. 10 inch blade seems to wobble less, give you the straightest cut and just power to blade size ratio just to me seems to be the best compromise of the bunch. So if it was me, I would actually buy a 10 inch saw blade. 
but miter saws come in 8, 10, and 12 inch depending on the type of work that you do. If you do very big boards like 4x6s or 4x8s, sometimes it's important to get that bigger capacity, but in general I would say most people would uh, get by with a 10 inch. Any good safety talk on a tool will talk about how people get hurt using it. Um, any injury that occurs in the wood shop is going to be a, a pretty bad and a pretty dangerous injury doesn't have to be every single time but there's such a high possibility that that's the case that you really need to operate in a wood shop as though you could never be hurt that you can't take any chances because if just one little thing goes wrong it could end up in such a catastrophic um, serious accident that it could permanently disfigure you for the rest of your life so it's very important to always ask yourself what kind of things can go wrong on a tool how could I get hurt using that tool and most importantly, how can I prevent any of those things from happening? And every tool has been designed so that it could be used safely. But the important thing is that you know how to use it safely, and probably even more importantly, that you do that every single time that you use the tool. You can't get complacent, you can't feel comfortable, and you can't say to yourself, ah, oh, I'm in a rush, or oh, I'll probably be okay this time. Okay, you can never think that. You gotta be ultra safe when you use these tools. So for this demonstration, you can see that I have the guard um, tied up out of the way so that um, this blade is exposed because I want you to be able to see the blade for this demonstration. Uh, I'll have you know the plug is out of the tool. I have dis, um, disconnected it and rendered the tool inert. So I pull the trigger just to make sure that there's no possibility of any accidents and I have the plug undone so that I know it's safe. Now, just as a quick note for shop safety, whenever you encounter a tool that has the plug laying up on the tool, that's a universal sign that something is wrong with that tool and that it's out of commission. So if you ever find a, a tool unplugged in this shop or any other shop that you go into and you see the plug up on the tool, that's a universal sign that it's out of commission and make sure you talk to the shop foreman before you just plug it in and start using it. Okay, so I'm gonna move this out of the way so we can actually see. Now, in general, when people get hurt on the miter saw, they usually do not just cut themselves. They very rarely drop the saw blade right into their hand. Now, I'm sure that's happened somewhere out there in the world and I'm sure it will happen again. But in general, people aren't stupid enough to just chop right through their hands, okay? So you gotta ask yourself, how do people get hurt on this saw then? If that's not what's happening, how do people get hurt? And the reason is, is the same reason on almost every tool, and that is something called kickback. And kickback can be a very violent, very quick um, action of the board being sh thrown across the room, shoved across the room, pulled out of your hands, um, dragged. Any of those things can happen to a board when it's being pushed into a blade. And in the wood shop, since we have to push everything into the blades, um, there's always that possibility. So what happens during a uh, kickback, okay? And we're gonna look at it because every tool is slightly different on how kickbacks happen. And it all depends on which way the board is going into the blade. So let's look at the miter saw. We've got the board right here on the table and I'm just gonna spin the blade by hand so you can see. So the blade's gonna start at the top here and it's gonna swing down and come up under and then it's gonna go around and then come back again in a big circle, okay? So where the blade contacts the board is important to note. So if I swing this down into the board here, the blade is gonna be spinning and the first area it's gonna contact is right here, okay? And the blade in essence is gonna be pushing this board straight down into the table and straight back into the fence, okay? So as we see here, I'll slide this board away just so you can see. So as I start to swing the blade, down, it pulls the board all the way back up against the fence. That's the important part to remember. So if something goes wrong at the miter saw, where is this board going to go and where might it drag your hands? So we've already learned that this board is going to get sucked into the saw this way. And we know kickbacks can happen very violently and very quickly and so we might not have time to react to it. 
and uh, that's usually the way people get cut is the board gets sucked into the saw or pushed across the blade and since our hands are attached to it often very firmly um, they get sucked in or pulled in as well and so if we were using this saw here um, what could happen is the board could get sucked in and our hand could go in as well so that's the real danger of using these saws is that kickback happening and pulling us in Okay, I'm going to actually show you a kickback at a reduced level of violence just so you can see what it is and how fast it happens. Okay, and then I'll tell you how to avoid that kickback. For this demonstration, I've got my safety glasses on and I'm going to keep my body as far back as possible. And I'm just going to barely be holding the saw up at the trigger so that my, I'm as safe as could be. But I wanted you to see what a kickback looks like, just how fast and violent it can occur so that you understand what you're dealing with. If you're one of those people that think, oh, I'm, I'm pretty quick, I could just pull my hand out of the way, you're deceiving yourself or you're just an idiot. It's impossible in many cases for you to do that. In almost 100% of the time, if something goes wrong here, you will not be able to pull your hand out and you will in fact be cut. So it's very important that this does not get pulled into the saw. Now every time it gets pulled in, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get cut. but there's always that possibility, so we want to be extra safe. So I have this set up. I'm going to do a quick demo and let you guys see what it looks like. It's not going to be full force because, well, I'll explain, I'll explain after I'm done why I didn't do it full force. So we just watched several instances of seeing a kickback. You saw some that were very uh, mild and some that were very uh, fast and very violent. It could be any one of those depending on how the blade contacts the board and what position it's in. But those are just some of the examples. In case it wasn't clear what you were watching, what I did was I let the blade come up to full speed and then I turned the saw off let it slow down to where it was almost stopped and then I moved the blade into the board. So that gave a very light sense of what a kickback is. Uh, when I was cutting at full speed you would see that thing kick back much more violently and I've actually had um, the fence break off of one of these miter saws when somebody had a kickback. It, and the board was right here and it actually kicked back so hard that it busted off the fence and you can imagine how hard it would be to generate that kind of force. Now you could imagine like if I went back into like a karate stance and tried to like do a palm strike on this thing full force I think I could probably snap it off but imagine generating that kind of power from just moving half of an inch or an inch and being able to snap that off. So it can hit very violently and very fast. So always something to think about when you use this saw. Okay, but I let the blade spin way down so that it wouldn't break anything and that it wasn't uh, overly dangerous for myself doing the demonstration. But I think now you get the idea of just how quickly things can go wrong. So. Now we have to start thinking about how can we prevent that stuff from happening. And the most important thing that you can do in regards to safety on a miter saw is to have that board flat on the table and flat on the fence. And the whole reason those are there is because the force of this blade is going to be pushing this board flat down into the table and flat down into the fence, okay, or flat back into the fence. So that's the most critical thing. If you could just 100% of the time say that this board would stay flat against the table and flat against the fence, it would eliminate 99.5% of all the accidents. Okay, But when that board gets loose, that's when you start to have problems. And just remember, not every board is perfect. Some have hidden knots, stress, they might have a nail buried in it. All kinds of different things can go wrong that you don't even see coming. So it's very important to uh, be safe when you're using this and make sure that thing stays up against the fence and up against the table. If you had a curved board that wouldn't sit flat there, you cannot cut it on this saw. This saw does, just does cross cuts and the board needs to be flat up against the fence and flat on the table. And if you can't make sure it is, then you can't cut that board on this tool. Okay, you have to find some other way.
Now that we've seen what can go wrong, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the features we need to use when we uh, utilize this saw. Things that will keep our body safe from harm. So the first thing that we want to use is this hold down clamp here. We can swing this into place and tighten the board down. That will hold the board in position so that it is less likely to be grabbed out of the saw and pulled away. So the hold down clamp is a very important safety feature. Okay. On top of that, we want to make sure that our hands never go closer than six inches to a blade. Okay, everyone thinks, oh, I'll just pull my hands out. And in reality, I've seen a lot of kickbacks as a shop teacher. I've seen kickbacks that happen to me, and I've seen them that happen to students. And my experience is that about six to eight inches, um, something will happen, the person's hands will move six to eight inches before they can pull them out of the way, before they get that, oh, oh my God, reflex and pull their hands out. So you can imagine if my hands are closer than six inches and something were to go wrong, my hands are gonna go into that saw. So very important safety tip on this, hands no closer than six inches. And this one actually has a little idiot sticker here. Don't put your hands past this line or you could get your fingers chopped off. So this one here has a little safety guide on it of where not to put your hands. Okay, it must be at least six inches though from any tool in the shop, including this miter saw. And the farther away, the better. To make a safe cut on the miter saw, what you need to do is allow the saw to reach full speed. Then you're gonna do a nice slow and steady cut through the board all the way until the blade completely stops. And then you're gonna slide it back until the blade completely stops. So on a narrow piece of wood, you won't need to slide it back at all. You can just make a chopping action. But on a wider piece of wood, say that was sticking out here, we would need to make a wider cut. We're gonna go all the way down and all the way back until it stops. Once you're done cutting through the board, you need to let the blade come to a complete stop and then let the blade up again. So a lot of times on construction sites, you won't see people waiting until the blade stops. Um, and that's fine on a construction site. It's not as big of a deal because you're not going for such precision. Um, in a fine woodworking or a finished carpentry, you're going to want to let the blades stop completely because these blades are made so that they run true at full speed, but they'll wobble back and forth a little bit as the blades are speeding up and slowing down. And that can give you a rough cut. So if I stop the blade, it's slowing down and wobbling a little and as I'm letting it up, that will give me a rough cut. So in our shop, it's important that we uh, stop the blade completely, wait till it comes to a complete stop and then let it back up. thing we need to do is make a few cuts and I apologize for the background noise I need to leave the dust collector on or it'll kick dust up into my face every cut so we're gonna make a few cuts we're gonna start with some easy ones and then we'll do a little bit more complicated things first off is gonna be a very typical cross cut on a 2x4 we're gonna make sure that the board is flat on the table flat up against the fence. That is the most critical thing in the cut. We are also going to make sure our fingers are at least six inches away. We're going to pull the saw blade down a little. We're going to let it come up to full speed and then make a slow steady cut. We're going to let it come to a complete stop and then let our saw up. There's a very simple cross cut. Okay, let's up the ante a little and do a little bit more difficult cut. We're gonna cut a wide board now. The process is going to be the same, except we're going to bring the center of the blade to the front of the board, and that's how we know where to start our cut. Again, everything else will be the same. Hands will be six inches away at least, 
We could be using the hold down clamp, I'm just not because I want to speed it up a little bit. All the way, middle of the blade, front of the board. Once the blade stops, we're done. I'm gonna show a more advanced version of that cut at a later time, but I didn't wanna um, make this video any longer than it already is. What happens if I need to cut a board that is too short for the clamp to reach, the clamp won't swing over and get it, and my hand would be too close? In that case, we have to do something special. So I've got a little hold down stick that we made and what this does is it keeps your fingers away from the, the blade. Now, you see how that stick is holding it? It's keeping it from coming away. Now the, the board could still kick back. It still could get grabbed into the saw and pulled into the saw. But the advantage of this is if that happens, it will just pull the board out. It will not be uh, putting my hand at any risk. So we would want to use that if it's something small. Now, let's pretend you have something real small like this. I can't get enough leverage with my hand to hold that very well. So I'm gonna show you one way to hold it and then I'll show you an advanced way in another video. Put the hold down stick down and I'm actually gonna use the hold down clamp to clamp that into place. So now I'm using the hold down clamp to push the stick down that it will hold this board in place. So now I'll go ahead and make my cut. Especially on cuts that have knots, um, cuts that are very short like this, anything where you know that there's a bigger danger than normal, you always wanna make sure that you go extra slow on your cut to make sure that you're not feeding too much pressure into the saw and the board so that it's gonna wanna move on you. The less pressure, the better, especially when doing something that has a higher risk factor to it. That way it will minimize the chance of that thing kicking back. If I was to see these boards moving at all when I started to cut, I would immediately stop the cut by lifting up the saw and letting it turn itself off by releasing the trigger, okay? So if you ever see a board move at all when you're cutting, that's a sure sign that something's gonna go wrong that the board's gonna grab. And at that point, you would definitely wanna stop immediately and let the blade up. Well, that's gonna conclude this episode. I'd like to thank you all for joining me in this uh, safety instructional on one of the most versatile tools in the wood shop, um, the miter saw. Thanks again, and if you appreciated the content, please like and subscribe. And until next time, I'll see you in the shop.